Assalamu alaikum and hello. I would like to welcome all our viewers from Qatar, the UK, the United States, and all around the world. My name is Fatma Dosari, the Executive Director of the Qatar America Institute for Culture, CAKE. We are a Washington, D.C. based nonprofit organization that create, curate, and uh, execute programs and research that is focused on uh, Qatar, the United States, and the larger Arab and Islamic worlds. I would like to welcome you again in another expression series where we host uh, creatives and experts who are focused on uh, Islamic and um, Arabic art from uh, Qatar, the United States, and the larger Arab and Islamic worlds. And we explore together their creative journey and how they were influenced and um, how they were inspired by their cultures and regions and even the people. Today, we are hosting a master uh, calligrapher, sculptor, and uh, a modernizer of the Arabic letter and calligraphy, uh, and a polymath artist, who is Sabah Al-Arbili. We are very happy to host you today, Sabah, and together we're going to discuss for about an hour um, your journey and your creative work, um, not just on the regional level, but also the international level. Um, I want to encourage our viewers to post their questions and to feel very welcome to ask um, any questions you have or comments for our artists today. So I want to uh, first introduce Sabah again and welcome you. Um, he's a, Sabah is an artist who was born in Iraq. He's a renowned visual artist and sculptor who holds a master's degree in visual arts from the Visual Institute of Traditional Arts, London, University of Wales. He has shown his calligraphy-based artworks widely and internationally throughout the Middle East and the world. Without further ado, I wanna ask you, uh, Sabah, to introduce yourselves uh, to the viewers um, and to tell us about uh, your creative journey so far. Uh, thank you so much, Fatima. Uh, very much appreciate for hosting me. And thanks, uh, Qatar America, for an opportunity for people to know me up close. And uh, my journey as an artist, I don't know where to start, to be honest with you. Being an artist by itself is a very tricky business in the world. But being born in Iraq, I believe, you know, it helped me to to get to the stage where I am right now. Because as an, as, as an artist, you always try to find a way, you know, to, to create your way out of any kind of difficulties. And born in Middle East, being in Middle East, it's such a helpful way to take you to that kind of journey, makes everything relatively easier. You know, any challenge comes to you, you always be able to find a solution for it. Let's start from the beginning as a, as a calligrapher, uh, you know, um, I was at school, I, I had a good handwriting, basically. And um, from there, you know, they were from, you know, my, my friends and my, you know, childhood friends, they were calling me, you are khattat, khattat in Arabic means a calligrapher. And I believe this is the beginning of how things are started. So uh, what happened is uh, uh, in my early age, uh, a friend of mine, and uh, he told me, you know, there is, uh, there is something called calligraphy. Why don't you try to uh, use calligraphy pen and stuff like that? Uh, so I was in my, you know, primary years, which is basically in a sixth grade. So uh, they, they gave me this pen and I was just writing anything. And there was something else. They said, oh, there is a bamboo people can, can use in al qasab and I said, okay, but how can I use? So they got me the qasab wal ahbar and that, you know, self-taught basically in the beginning, you don't know what you're doing, but it's just inspiring, you know, you just keep on to do things to a, to a stage when my parents, they get really fed up and they say, are you not gonna uh, do your studying proper? Because otherwise, you know, you will end up doing these writings, pointless writings and forget your studying. So, uh, Basically, that's how it started. So feel yeah. free if you have any questions. Wonderful. Um, in one of your interviews, Sabah, you said that you don't see yourself as a conventional calligrapher because you studied engineering, which gave you a wider vision of the dynamics 
um, in understanding the space around you and what extent and to what extent um, you can be flexible with your designs. So in a way, you are like a, a reborn artist. Can you tell us more about that? What was really interesting is, so going back to the beginning, I all I wanted to be a calligrapher, you know, it's classical calligrapher, because it's such a highest achievement in Middle East, you know, to be a good calligrapher because of all these rules and uh, geometrical form for letter, and you have to keep practicing on a daily basis, five, six hours, until you get to the stage, just like old masters. So my aim in the beginning, just to become a good calligrapher, but it was an eye opener when I came to UK, basically, you know, I failed miserably because as soon as I arrived here, you know, uh, for the newcomers, when they come to the country, they welcome them and they tell them, what do you do? What's your, uh, what's your hobby? What's, so I told them, you know, I'm a calligrapher, I am blah, blah. They said, okay, um, we're going to have a, like a little show for you. When they did a little show for me, I was doing it as, as a, you know, same mind as I was in Iraq. So I was thinking about writing things in a lovely way, in a calligraphic way. But it was a, you know, a big failure because, you know, people who they came to the exhibition, it was a very small exhibition. They had no idea what is calligraphy. So it is, it's not easy to explain to people something if they don't have a background about it. So no matter how beautiful I do the writings, for example, according to the geometrical and, and uh, rules of calligraphy, but for people, they have no background of calligraphy. They have no understanding about it, yeah? So I said, that was an, an eye-opener. So every failure is a beginning of success, basically. And uh, so I too, as, as you said, I was researching and trying to think like an artist, not as a calligrapher anymore. So that's how it started, basically, in the UK. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Can you tell us about your shift from the UK to Doha and your creative journey in Doha and how it kind of supported, you know, your um, inspirations and uh, your thought process? I'm really curious to know about uh, why you moved there and uh, how, you know, you um, got really uh, interested to kind of use the culture or kind of any kind of, uh, as I said, inspirations around you from, from Qatar and your artwork? Well, what happened is, uh, so I was in UK, I settled when I settled in UK. And as a calligrapher, it didn't work out in the beginning of 2000. So I said, all right, what I'm going to do, I pack my bag in terms of calligraphy, I'm not going to be doing it anymore, because it's pointless. And, and by then it was, uh, uh, I was trying to do different type of jobs and different works to be away from the calligraphy in the beginning because I was trying to you know, read more about the artistic side and everything, try to re-educate myself, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly a, a competition happened in Qatar in 2003 of, uh, so I was one of the winners and they invited me over there. And 2003, Qatar was you know, relatively, uh, you know, the beginning of the boom in terms of construction and everything. So when I went there, and the people were extremely friendly and nice to me and uh, very welcoming. So I started to have, you know, a lovely connection with people over there. And uh, so after that, when I come back here, I, I studied when I studied my masters and everything, I was always in contact with people in Qatar. I was in contact with the Ministry of Awqaf, with the Ministry of Culture, with, with all these artists over there. And they always advised me to come over here because things are happening here, you know, faster than anywhere else. And to my amazing luck, you know, when I decided to go there and the World Cup happened, which means, you know, everything is shifted 180 degree to, you know, extra productive country in terms of art, in terms, in terms of everything, you know, you've got the most amazing museum, Islamic Arts Museum in Doha. So uh, you've got all these uh, uh, ministries who they take calligraphy in a such a high level, which is absolutely a boost for me as a calligrapher and as an artist. So when, when they gave me an opportunity to go and work in Qatar, I never even thought twice straight away. I decided to pack my bag and go to Qatar. That's amazing. Um, you also say in one of your interviews that uh, artists such as Jackson Pollock and Andy Warhol were, and among many others, have been 
uh, a source of uh, inspiration and gave you confidence uh, to think outside of the box. And as a ca classic calligrapher, some people might think that this is such an interesting um, kind of uh, comment that you say, for example, such modern artists have been source of inspiration for you. So can you tell us a little bit more about how you see them um, as your source of inspiration and other American artists, if you have others? Um, and how do you see that intersection between uh, classic and modern calligraphy? Oh my God, this is a very interesting question because, <laughs> because what happened is, you know, when, when you trained as a classic calligrapher, everything is, oh, this is not allowed, this is allowed, this is not allowed. And with my all due respect, even in Iraq, in our culture, this is allowed, this is not allowed, this is allowed. But when you shift into a modern society of art, it was a thinking outside of box. And it was in every sense of way, it was a complete shock to me, you know, how these artists were really brave, try to express the way they want towards any, any kind of art or any kind of um, ideas they have in their mind without any hesitation. So, you know, nowadays, for example, Banksy, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Banksy in, in every way because he is trying to make a, a little, a, you know, a little subject more interesting than anything else. You know, any, any, any subject he is, he is going to touch, it will be a massive hit. And this is what really art is all about, especially these days. Um, uh, so when when you're shifting from classic, you are not allowed to do this, you are not allowed to do that. And then you're going to do the other thing is like um, in a modern art, which is, you know, there's an open door. Everything is allowed. All you have to do is brave enough and express yourself the way you want to. So I remember the first, uh, the first time when I was trying to shift basically from classic to because you know in, in classic I I won all these first prizes in, in classic competitions. How do you how are they gonna define your name and your ability in terms of classic is through the competitions basically happens every two years in Turkey, in Iraq, in places like that. So basically when I when I won the competitions I felt like there is no more challenge in classic. So you have to uh, evolve in a sense it has to you have to have your own touch because everybody's journey is different since i have my own journey since i have my own way to express things the best way is through modern way to to communicate with people so i put this in the test basically when i try to to shift from classic to modern i made some pieces and i did a mini exhibition as well you know before i show it to anybody else before i you know trying to to go to that direction because most of the time you know classical calligraphers you know before me what they did is you know they were trying to have a different direction but they end up losing both you know because um, if you're not going to be uh, practical in a sense you do modern art in a such a high level you will end up losing your name as a classical artist so I did a mini show and I showed it to, you know, friends and uh, people and I told them, please be brutal in terms of, you know, criticizing me and things like that. You know, whatever you have in your mind, I'm okay, I can take it. But, you know, some of them were really brutal, I must admit, you know, but, but I loved it. I loved it because this kind of thing, it gives you a boost. Let's not forget, you know, we all human, you know, we, we all, you know, feed from each other's energy. And for me, you know, when I see a big artist, you know, throughout history, especially the modern uh, contemporary artists, when they do things, it does give me an energy. It does give me the boost, you know, tell, okay, I can use calligraphy to that direction, which is, it has my touch, but in a very contemporary way. Mm -hmm. yeah. really interesting. The kind of the boost and um, the, you know, the confidence, and the energy that you just mentioned that, you know, all these kind of comments gave you. I, also historically, uh, calligraphy is known or is defined as an art where the early calligraphers used to use it as a way or a form to worship. So can you tell us a little bit how, if, if you feel that also calligraphy has been in any way spiritual journey for you 
um, as you mentioned in a couple also other interviews, that it helped you to connect with your culture and with um, kind of to spread positivity with uh, about the Middle East and about your culture. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Of course, what was really fascinating is when you come to this part of the world, for example, when I came to UK, no matter who you are, but still people see you as a refugee with my all due respect. Okay, but how are you going to be okay as a refugee, it doesn't matter, but how are you going to be able to portray yourself in a way to integrate with the society, but in the same time, you're going to be able to tell your story through your art in, in my case, you know, my tool of expression is my art. So uh text is, is is really takes me all the way before the text i cannot do anything it has to have a there has to be a text which is direct me to the journey of making the artwork so when when somebody for example giving me a quranic verse uh to tell me can you make this into art or turn this into art i get really uh, you know amazed how how the ideas forming in my head in order, you know, and it's going to be a clear vision. I need to go to this direction because I feel like this text has to be in that direction. You know, if the text is, is uh, poetry, for example, it will give me to the completely different direction. And for me, you know, subject is matter. You know, subject is where, you know, makes you... Uh, make a right decision for the color, for even sometimes for the size. You know, if, if the, uh, there is a lot of um, collectors when they ask me, would you please make this piece into artwork for me? I usually tell them, you know, this is such a powerful thing. You know, it has to be expressed in a bigger size because when it is small, I feel like you're taking away from the, be from the beauty of the text. So let's make it, you know, try to provide another place in your house for it. So we can be, uh, you know, as free as we can in terms of expression. Yeah. Being in Middle East, unfortunately, since I am, you know, um, I born in 1977, since uh, the day I, I born, it's been a conflict, it's been problematic, it's been everything. And somehow, you know, this kind of thing it will channels in into your mind and it will in a different way makes you to express the brush you know that I've got I've got pieces um, after I've done everything I really get the urge to destruct it I've got I really get an urge you know a portion of it to remind me of some something which is um, the memory stored in my head and it just comes back for that particular moment and I need to express it in that way. The question is, I always tell myself, why is the brain is, is such a strange thing which is direct to you exactly what to do, which is everything is based, what's really stored in, in you as a culture, as a person, as a, as a religion, as everything. Mm -hmm. that, that's fascinating. I want to switch now, Sabah, the conversation. I bet we have a lot of viewers who are, who are really intrigued now to see your artwork. So we want to provide our viewers with a couple of uh, Sabah's amazing uh, paintings and artwork um, and for him to tell you his own description um, of his artwork in his own words. So um, we will see that now. Uh, what I would like to say about the, the artworks that we're going to see uh, in every solo show, I try to make sure, you know, every piece or, you know, every collection, uh, it has a subject and it has a meaning, which is, it will be an eye opener for, you know, for the audiences. So, for example, this piece. Regarding, regarding this piece, this piece called Hope, I made it in 2003 and the text 13, sorry, the text at the background is Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana. And uh, what's really interesting about this piece in particular, you know, when it says Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, it is, you know, all about good deeds, all about good things. And uh, 
don't try to to uh, you know hide things when it is when it is good because this is this is my way of interpretation basically and this is why you know there is there is a different forms of good deeds you know there's different colors of good deeds everybody can express it in a different way and uh, by by ex no matter no matter what you do try to make it to 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 let it shine even if it's from the background even if it is uh even if it is hard sometimes so this is why if you can see you know there's some areas being wiped out and the other areas are showing and the letters are expressed in a different format oh yeah this this is a very fascinating project um it was like a three years ago when the, the, the interesting thing about, about you know, paintings or, or artworks or anything in general, it's how at this particular moment, you know, you forget about the rest of the things while you are looking at the artwork because most of the people, you know, I wanted, I wanted to engage audience uh, by, by looking at the writings or reading it by the time they're reading it without even they realize they smile because they just read ha 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 but in reality they smile about it so i just wanted to capture that particular moment and you forget about everything else and you will end up uh, looking at the artwork and smile about it the collection was uh, it's basically you know even the background and everything a representation of a true representation of the meaning which is ha ha ha, ha which is you know um, there's variety of ways we can we can laugh about things we can we can smile about things and be as cheerful as you can uh, this is one of my you know all-time favorite collection that i did because life is about basically i always life is about two people which is it says me and you and i will enter in this particular page a piece of artwork you know it's just like a me and you and the hidden meaning behind it, me and you we are you know completing the circle of life together and we grow and grow and grow together because one circle is representing the other circle and this is how it goes life is about action and reaction and this is more you know when there is a harmony between anna and anta life is going to be more you know interesting more beautiful and and the the structure of life which is a representation of the structure of the artwork is is much more nicer when there is a harmony when there is we both you know going around the circle with one tone basically so in in ano anta uh, collection every time i make ano anta there is a different way of of uh, of uh, representation of the of the word me and you the reason me and you you know in this particular one different than the other one the other ones, the other ones, which is um, based on the text. As every time when I when I read the poetry and it's about these two people, I try to translate it in a way. And every piece of artwork, I usually write the the poetry or whatever you know the Quranic uh, verse hidden somewhere in the artwork. But I'm not going to write it in a very uh, obvious way. I want an audience to search for it and find the meaning and find the text in an interesting way. Uh, I'm honored and basically proud to have my sculpture in my favorite place, uh, uh, which is Qatar. You know, it's been 10 years. I live in Qatar, I work in Qatar, and I love every second of it. The approach that we had here in this particular sculpture you know we wanted to with uh, with the help uh, uh, of um, occidental i don't want to make a mistake with the names with the occidental they wanted to to make a, uh, a special project and when we came up with the idea of making a sculpture in a very prominent uh, location in qatar it comes with this view and everything 
And uh, what's really fascinating when I showed them, uh, you know, the proposal in the beginning, they said, no, 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 this is too complicated. What is this? Nobody can read, read this. And I said, this is the amazing point behind it. I don't want people to just, you know, read it and pass by there and read it and thank you very much. Art is not about reading. Art is about making something really interesting and, and gives you this boost or this, um, uh, you know, question mark in your head so you can search for the meaning or search for the text or search for the reading. So uh, in the beginning, it was, it was really hard until we, we convinced, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the amount of people until, until we got the success and we made the, uh, the sculpture. But what was, what was lovely about it, when we made the sculpture, you know, we, I, was, uh, uh, I was sat there and uh, we did this like an experiment uh, looking at uh, anybody who was passing by there because this is a very, very popular location and people comes for the walking, for jogging and, and everything in Corniche. So whoever passed by, by the sculpture, you know, um, automatically taking the phone out of your po of their pocket and you know taking either a selfie with it or taking a photo of the artwork and uh, mostly foreigners and uh, but I was absolutely fascinated you know the amount of, of response you know the amount of uh, amount of interest I got from people and, and the response I got was absolutely mesmerizing and positive. Uh, this is one of my uh, pieces, which is uh, I made in 2011, I believe. There is a Quranic verse, which is um, I was always fascinated by. It says, "Bala uh, qadrina ala an nusawiya bananaho," which means uh, which means basically uh, at the end of the days, you know, the day of judgment, we we recreate your fingerprints. So I call this piece identity. Uh, what, what's really fascinating behind this artwork, you know, ev ev we all have a fingerprint and everyone is different than the other. But I wanted to, to make the artwork with the same word and it, it will echo because the fingerprint, it, it echoes from one person to another, but each one of us is different, basically. It's just like a, it's our identity. We all human, but we have a different identity. Uh, this is a solo exhibition that I did in uh, in in Bahrain uh, in 2017. Uh, what I like to play with the words, and when you play with with a variety of words, sometimes you know some of them is stand out more than the other. The word asif, you know, let's put it that way: asif is the beginning of making things right. You know, the moment you realize. You made a mistake. The moment you realize, okay, uh, you are ready to apologize. The sky is a limit for for you, you know, to be whoever you want to be, to be, you know, a right a person with the right path, to be a person who who loves to do things in the right way. So I was so fascinated by this word. And if you see, for example, here in this particular piece, you know, the background is black. You know, it's like um, uncertainty. And then when I put the word "asif" in a in a in a golden golden color, and then there's these little lines. It's like a, it it takes you out of all this stress that you have once you are apologizing. And um, the word "asif" is the beginning of the right thing. So uh, when 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 we when we did the show, I remember every time. Uh, everybody was looking at the artwork, they would say, but why Asif? So, but it was lovely because I had to tell everybody the same story again and again. But the thing is, we as human, we all make mistakes. And when I was explaining the artworks to, to the audience, we all, we all had you know, the same stories because we all felt related. The audience would felt related when they were looking at the word asset because somehow we all been through these kind of situations. So this is really interesting if you try to put art into the real context of life. And I, this is always fa fascinating me anyway. My this is my subject as usual. Uh, 
Uh, this is one, one of the pieces uh, we did in 2013 with the uh, human rights in Qatar. Uh, personally, I would like to thank human rights, you know, uh, human rights committee. They do an absolutely great job, you know, by introducing art as a form of uh, communication with the, uh, with the international audience. When they approached me and they said, we have, uh, we have this text and we want you to translate it into the artistic touch. Uh, in the beginning, uh, you know, I told them, is there any limitation how to be creative? Uh, in the beginning, we did a collection we called the classic collection. But with the classic collection, we felt like there is no movement in the artwork. We felt like it's a bit dry because still the letter formation of Arabic calligraphy was there, but you know, we just played around with the, with the text, with the shape of the text. But they said, no, if, if you can come up with a different approach uh, for the next collection, I'm sure it's gonna be more international and more fascinating. In this particular case, you know, there is a, 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 there is a, a, a text that says, تَعَالُوا إِلَى كَلِمَةٍ سَوَى بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ so what I did is I highlighted the letter or the words in a different direction, but we have a common ground between us. And this exhibition we exhibited in, in uh, United Nations headquarters in, uh, in Geneva. And uh, this is one of the pieces as well. It had a big uh, impact because again, all we wanna do as a humanity, we try to make things work. And uh, while we exhibiting this in uh, United Nation, uh, they felt like, uh, okay, we are here for this particular reason. We try to, uh, you know, solve the problems. And the text they were, made them really fascinated. Uh, my favorite piece of uh, of all time. I all started from this, basically. You know, the first uh, the first piece I did of this, uh, uh, it was uh, the original piece with my, you know, dearest friend and collector, Mr. Ibrahim Fakhro. Uh, and what happened is after that, you know, we did a reformat of the Wajahannakum Shu'uban Wa Qaba'ila in a different way of expression. The, the artwork itself, you know, I wanted to make it related to Qatar somehow because they gave an original um, a small version to the United Nations headquarters by the time of the ex exhibition. This piece it says, وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلَ لِتَعَارَفُوا No matter what background you are, no matter what color you are, no matter who you are, we are in this together. So let's just live it. Basically, that was the whole concept behind. So this is the form of a tarf of communication of get to know one another. Thank you so much, Sabah, for this presentation. Um, I'm sure that our audience really loved seeing all this kind of different from sculpture to painting and all, all your marvelous um, artwork. Um, I want actually to echo your gratitude and uh, thank the National Human Rights Committee of Qatar for uh, their uh, generosity in um, sending us their, your collection to exhibit in Washington, D.C. Uh, starting this month to uh, April or May uh, 2021. Um, and uh, the exhibition is called Transcendent Text, Exploring Universal Values Through uh, Islamic Calligraphy. And, uh, and we're really proud to, after taking this collection throughout Europe uh, and in Doha and different locations, that it's finally made it to uh, the United States, uh, starting by the nation's capital, and um, also for us to be able to contribute with your artwork um, in uh, during the uh, Qatar US Year of Culture 2021. 
and also the Doha Capital uh, of Islamic Culture 2021. So there are a lot of things that we can uh, celebrate for next year. And I'm sure um, with this, I want to ask you, Sabah, for your plans for next year. What is uh, uh, kind of your uh, creative journey? Where is it going to take you next year? Well, um, they were to start uh, 2020, it was a complete letdown in <laughs> every way, but let's just be hopeful and uh, uh, this is all we can do, you know, being hopeful for a greater future. I personally, you know, um, I always tell myself, you know, I count in every day as, as it is the last day. And in terms of art, you know, I always racing against time to do things. Lately, I had, a, you know, some, some scare, which is, uh, it was an eye opener, basically, you know, I had a blood clot and I was, you know, in a very strange, uh, uh, I was absolutely fine, fit and everything, and suddenly uh, I was really close um, of a very catastrophic situation. So um, I will tell you this as a, you know, to the audience as a joke. Um, as an artist, you know, you have this idea in your head that you're going to live forever. This is one thing. And secondly, according to the plans I have in my, in my, in my hand and in my head, I, uh, you know, it feels like there is endless possibilities. So when, when, when doctor told me, oh, Saba, you know, uh, I'm glad that you, you made it on time. Otherwise, you know, the clot, it was on your lung and it was just about to hit your heart and it would have been you gone. And I said, doctor, what are you talking about? Because according to that plan I have in my head, exhibitions I have in my head, I have to live at least 200 years. So now you, but time to time, I am negotiating with myself. Okay, 180 years. Okay, Saba, settle. You're going to be the longest person to live, 180 years. So you can finish all your artworks. You can finish all your things. He said, no, you know. So since then, it was a, a completely, I have a completely different approach in, in life, you know. And uh, one of the things is, is uh, you know, just try to, to make sure uh, whatever you have in your head, whatever you have in your mind, just just do it you know do not postpone things do not do things do not let things out of your hand uh i've been i'm slowing down these days because i'm under you know this very strong medication like a blood thinning thing but uh, uh my you know my note there is like a thousands of ideas in it there is thousands of 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 concepts and things I, I am I am working closely these days with the, a, a collection that I do for Qatar Petroleum in, in Qatar. And uh, I am making uh, two books right now. I'm working on it. And, uh, one of them is classic and the other one is modern. Uh, as I said, you know, the other, a lot of things was postponing and I was just saying, no, I'm still young, man, leave it. I'll do it later, I'll do it later. But when this has happened, I said, no, I better just, you know, bring it forward, everything, make sure things are done uh, properly. So in 2021, uh, this uh, 2020, I have three exhibitions, you know, three shows basically, but none of them happened. We may think about rescheduling it or, you know, put this on the side because now the world has changed. You know, the approach of life changed drastically. You know, now we have to look at things in a different way. You know, just like um, before life, before COVID, life after COVID, this is a definition nowadays. So I'm absolutely surprised what's life after COVID going to be like for exhibitions, what life is going to be like for, for, you know, live shows as an artist and things like that. Even for everybody, it's a, it's a new thing. We don't know what territory we're going to go for. I was really looking forward to, you know, to come to, uh, to the States. But unfortunately nowadays, because uh, everything is on standby, but as for April, definitely I'm gonna be there. And looking forward, you know, to, to engage with the audience and, uh, you know, to explain to them about the artworks, the process of my artwork. We may even do a live show, you know, making an artwork and we give it to charities and things like that. So uh, it's all possibilities. Definitely. And we're really looking forward to that and to your visit to DC and to be part of Transcendent Text and for people to be able to meet you in person and learn from you. Um, and I'm sure, you know, everyone will be really excited for that. Um, actually talking about the pandemic, 
um, in one of your interviews, you said art is part of our daily life. And the best way to observe the reality is by capturing the moment of transition through a deep thought. And, you know, you just kind of went through the your deep thoughts of, you know, your personal own kind of, you know, uh, health um, situation and, and the togetherness um, of, you know, the world being in also a health scare. Um, so can you tell us um, from your own view, as you said, life post COVID, how do you see um, kind of the creative process and, um, you know, the world of art uh, heading towards after COVID? Well, let's, let's not forget, we all, we as a human, we all are very selfish in a sense, you know. When this has happened in the beginning, I thought, okay, this is really good. It's time for me to catch up with, you know, some, uh, uh, you know, uh, some projects or some orders from, from the client. But then, uh, if you think deeper, if you, you know, sit back and look at the situation, it's much bigger than you as a person, as an artist, you know, I know it's, we are lucky as an artist, you know, we always have something, you know, to go to, you know, try to completely switch off from the reality and live in this bubble we created for ourselves. And I call it, you know, my happy zone. That happy zone, I can always go there. And, uh, but what about the people who are losing their life? They have much more, you know, there is much more important thing is in stake, which is life than, you know, than art. So in the beginning, as I told you, it was, it was, I, I was full of energy. Honestly, I was, you know, trying to do this, this and this. And even a friend of mine, uh, one of the collectors called me and said, we have these two pieces. Now you have absolutely no excuse. You have to make this because it's been a year I'm waiting you have to make it for me. I said, yeah, 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 nothing to worry about. It is going to be done. But bit by bit, you know, every day, if you're looking at the news, you realize, you know, the precious life of your uncle, your cousin, you know, people around you who they wanted to live as much as you are. They just fade it. So it will affect you. It will tell you, you know, this is a message of life. It tells you slow down and, uh, try to think, uh, look at things in a completely different perspective. Mm -hmm. in, in my case, you know, as I said, you know, I always try to find a way to be positive uh, and I'm happy, you know, that my art, it takes me to the positive direction. Even, you know, if you're making it, uh, if you're making one little, little writing sometime as a classic or modern, you just don't know, but maybe it will touch somebody's life somewhere else. You know, you're writing a text, but that text, it will, uh, it will make a day for somebody which you have no idea. I remember when I, I, I always go back to the very basic day of, of my day become a calligrapher. When I was, I was that child at my, you know, fourth grade, let's say, when I first started this thing, you know, one day I was late at school, uh, in my primary school, and uh, you, as I was entering the school, my teacher was writing something with a Yamza, that these days the Kotabashir, which is you know the chalks, you know they were writing on on a blackboard in Iraq. While he was doing something like calligraphy, I didn't know this is calligraphy, but for that particular moment, because I was late, I come home that glimpse, I looked at this piece, and I stood and I look at the artwork and it changed my life, I know I'm talking to you. So you don't know, you just, you, as an artist, you try to write the most beautiful text according to you, or a text that you get inspired, you write in it and you publish it and somebody else will get inspired. So hopefully, you know, whatever I, I do as an artwork or whatever I write as a calligrapher, it will inspire some people to go through this pandemic. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I want to take some questions from our viewers. Um, we have one question here asking, what inspired you to create modern art and what role does a manager play in your art? Uh, well, the thing is, the thing is uh, as I said earlier from the beginning, being, being, uh, uh, you know, being a modern artist or to go to that direction, it was mostly um, about communicating, you know, being in connection with the audience. 
okay, to feel related. That was that was the main thing for me to tell my story because our story, Ma Al Asab, you know, with my all due respect, uh, coming from Middle e Middle East, is just full of adventures. Let's put it that way. So you have to find the ground so you can talk to people about it. Art is the best form of communication. And you have to manage, manage your way uh, so you can do things, you know, um, having, you know, having a perfect team, it will help you to take you to the right direction. And somebody who tells you straight, you know, this is good, this is bad, do that, do this and don't do this. Because you, whatever we do as a human, this is why we all make mistakes. You know, whatever you do, you think it's right until you know it's not right. But when you have a right team around you, it tells you, oh, we prefer this over this, or this has more, uh, you know, influence than the others, then you just take things into consideration and take the right direction, basically. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Let's see. We have another question here. Um, do you ever use textiles as a medium? Uh, not yet. No, I, I've, um, funny enough, you know, I, I did a lot of research. I wanted to, uh, to add some textile, but until now I am not, you know, not perfected it because before you start any artwork, you know, especially let's say, let's say there is a white canvas in front of me. I just don't start until the, the, the complete image forms in my head, you know, and then you take it from there. So when it comes to techniques, you have to make sure you perfect in it the way you want, okay? I did a lot of trials, but I wasn't successful yet, 100% for me to be happy to, you know, to showcase it. But this is something I always fascinated by, definitely. Wonderful. Let's see. We have a lot of questions coming in. A lot of people are interested to hear more. Oh, hopefully. <laughs> um, how has coming face to face with your mortality changed your approach to your artwork? Are you picking different subjects or do you feel like you need to do more or take more time with each piece? Can you please repeat that if you don't mind? Sure. This is a complicated one. How has coming face to face with your mortality, so like the health scare, oh, okay. changed your approach to your artwork? Are you picking different subjects or different styles for, um, you know, doing your artwork, or do you feel like you need to do more? Uh, definitely need to do more. However, you know, you know, uh, the close friends around me, they're always telling me you should have seen completely differently. You should just chill now, you know, forget. But for me, no, I had to post to uh, bring forward the postponed projects. And uh, to be honest with you, it, it was one of the very interesting uh, subjects. When, uh, when I was, you know, when, when, when I was in the hospital and I was thinking, wow, I never thought one day, because you feel, you know, when, when you're healthy and everything, you never feel one day you're going to be in this kind of situation. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting when you put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Yeah, I never, I, I never put myself in this kind of position. I never knew how was it. But as far as the art side is concerned, it really affected me. It really made me to, you know, to go deeper even in, in, in my art. You know, I even be selective. You know, it used to be, I wasn't, I wasn't selective on things as much as now. Uh, so is it indirectly affected me? I don't know yet, but I'm still figuring things out, you know. But in, in reality, in reality, I, I realized one thing, which is, you know, life is much, much shorter than you think. So do not postpone things and just be there. Just do things you have in your head, things that makes you happy, really. Um, we have actually a couple questions from young viewers. I know, Sabah, that you've had a couple of workshops or engagements with Virginia Commonwealth University uh, in Doha, in Qatar. And um, some of them are interested to know from your experience, if you have a manager who is managing your art 
and would you advise um, others to have managers or how can they kind of take their, um, um, let me say, passion and education when it comes to art to the professional level? Yeah. Well, the thing is, you have to have a manager, no doubt about it. Yeah, because at the end of the day, don't forget, you, you know, you cannot do everything by yourself because it will be impossible. It will be messy. You know, you as an artist, you cannot concentrate on the, uh, you know, managing side of the situation, you know, the paperwork and things like that. When, um, by the way, you know, teaching in VCU, it, it was very adventurous, I must admit, you know, because the, with my all due respect, you know, in Qatar, um, there's a lot of people who are interested in calligraphy. Okay, when, 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 when we announce a calligraphy course, they think there's going to be a calligraphy uh, art. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I always say, in order for you to to learn more art in general, first you have to have a basics of calligraphy. You have to to master. You have to master the the, the basic rules of calligraphy. Then your mind, you know, bit by bit, it will be more creative, and it will take you to a different direction. But if you don't have this, you know, ground, you know, a strong base of your, of your knowledge, then today you do things, tomorrow you do completely different, different things. So I, I was always telling them, you know, calm down, guys. It is, you know, first we're going to do, you know, basic alphabet, uh, team, all these kind of things. And then later on, your time to shine, you know, how you're going to be creative. Since you have everything in your hands, since, since everything's in your system, it's easy for you to manipulate the system according to what you want. Yeah. So uh, oh, oh, you have, you know, not just a manager, you have to have a big team around you because you have to have honest friends around you. You have to have, most importantly, as an artist, you have to have all these kind of materials around you because it's really helpful you know suddenly you want to create something out of a material you know you have to make sure have the material before the idea goes away and then just you know do the, an experiment you may like it you may don't like it so don't leave any things for the you know for imagination just do it yeah yeah absolutely that's a great advice um i want to wrap up because we're getting close to the end of our hour with you here sabah uh, the times really fly. So we wanted just to know um, more about the collection that we have here in DC, the 20 paintings uh, that were commissioned by the National Human Rights Committee of Qatar. Um, and we uh, packaged them together under a transcendent text exploring universal values through Islamic calligraphy. Um, we want to know more about your inspiration, about the correlation between the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Quranic uh, verses and the Hadith by the Prophet. And if you can tell us more about this collection, um, I think everyone here uh, today is really interested to know more. Well, I always say, you know, for me to find a text by myself, it's one of the hardest things because, you know, between 100 texts, you have to choose one or two and get inspired by it. But when somebody, you know, says, okay, we've got a project, this is the text, they make my life much easier. All I need is, you know, how to be imaginative, how you're going to be creative to express the text accordingly. And uh, the challenge about this, uh, this particular project, you know, um, in 1950s, there was, uh, you know, um, the human right, uh, what do you call it? you know, the human rights convention and things like that set up. But we were trying to tell the story in a different way. It says in Quran and in Islamic uh, principles, 1,400 years ago, we have these kind of things. So what they did is basically they matched both of them together. We brought the articles of the human rights. In the same time, the Quranic verses talking about exactly same subject of human right, but the difference is the different. Uh, uh, the difference is 1,400 years ago, so it was an eye opener. Basically, you know, wh whenever we take this exhibition anywhere, because of the text, because of the core meaning behind it, it always a hit. Because you know, as you as you know, you know, just maybe not even 
the people with a Muslim background, they don't have much knowledge about, uh, about the religion. Uh, but imagine when everything is translated in a, in a lovely way, in a very simple way, and there is an artwork next to it, which is it gives you a visual satisfaction for the text you have in front of you. So uh, people are very appreciating about this collection and I'm, I'm happy for that. It's always been a success. That's wonderful. Um, I just wanna reiterate that we have the collection right now in our headquarters in Washington, DC. And um, this is one of them behind me. And we uh, will exhibit the, uh, the artwork uh, from January to April, 2021. And uh, we will have uh, the exhibition available for our visits and tours. And we're also announcing that we're gonna digitize this exhibition and it will be available for anyone's convenience uh, at home. We'll be, they'll be able to view the artwork, but we definitely encourage the in-person uh, visits. So you get to see the artwork up close. And hopefully in April, we will get to have Sabah in person visiting us um, and talking about his uh, artwork um, in person. And uh, with that, I just want to thank you again, Sabah, for your time and uh, for uh, being part of Expression Series and to give us kind of the um, insights that you have about your creative journey. It was such a pleasure to have you today. And uh, I want to thank, again, the National Human Rights Committee of Qatar for their generosity in giving us uh, their collection and loan. So we get to celebrate Sabah's artwork in Washington, D.C. And uh, I want to thank the viewers for joining us today. And uh, I would like to invite you to join us next week uh, on the 17th. We're going to have another expression series with Professor J.R. Osborne from Georgetown University and the CCT program at uh, Georgetown University. So thank you again, Sabah, and thank you everybody, and ma'asalama. Thank you so much, Fatima. Thank you, Qatar America. It's my, my pleasure. Thanks for your time. Very much appreciated. Thank you, take care. Thank you.